modern strength programming, coaches and lifters often seek simple yet effective metrics to improve our ability to prescribe, individualize, and monitor training. One of the most widespread metrics is called estimated 1RM. By using a few simple input variables, lifters gain access to information that can transform the way you program and monitor training. However, many assumptions have been made to generalize these relationships to all lifters. In today's video, we'll discuss a recently published meta-analysis that changes the game with regards to estimated 1RM calculations. An estimated 1RM is just as it sounds. Using a few simple inputs, we are predicting your maximal performance capacity on a given exercise, i.e. your one repetition maximum or 1RM. Typically, this is calculated by referencing a relationship between the actual or predicted repetition maximum performed with a given percentage of 1RM. Just as an example, let's say that I perform a set of squats with 405 pounds for five reps in one RAR. This is gonna be a predicted six RM. One could then reference a table that assigns each of these rep max values to a given percentage of 1RM. For this example, we'll use the classic NSCA table, which says that a 6RM equates to 85% of your 1RM. Finally, to get the estimated 1RM, we simply divide the load used by the percentage of 1RM associated with the rep max. So in this case, 185 kilos or 405 pounds divided by 0.85 and you're gonna get an estimated 1RM of 217 kilos or 478 pounds. This number can be used for a variety of things. Since proximity to failure seems to have a minimal influence on maximal strength outcomes, it's not uncommon to see protocols that have lifters training with a decent amount of reps in the tank. For these types of protocols, subjective load prescription methods like RIR are more prone to inaccuracy. Thus, coaches generally opt for other options. An extremely common example would be perform a top set, something like three reps at two RIR, followed by back off sets at a given percentage of that estimated 1RM, let's say 75% for three sets of five. Number can also serve as a better measuring stick of progression than reps and load in isolation. For example, if a lifter performs a block with a descending top set rep scheme, something like four reps, three, two, and then one, all out of two RIR, the load on the bar is likely to artificially increase due to the decreased rep range. However, estimated 1RM will be able to pick up on if the lifter is actually demonstrating an increase in performance in their capacity week to week. For hypertrophy training, a similar thing can be said for double progression strategies. If you add load compared to the week prior, it may feel that you're progressing even if the number of reps drops a decent amount. However, your estimated 1RM may actually be decreasing, which offers a potentially more useful subset of information to base programming decisions upon. Now, I'm not saying to overinterpret estimated 1RM trends, and we often steer lifters away from taking week to week trends under a microscope, but the point is to highlight how estimated 1RM can account for fluctuations in reps, load, and RIR to better gauge our performance and progression thereof. Now, as I've gone through some of these details related to estimated 1RM, you can probably see that it relies on a few assumptions. One, there is a known relationship between a given rep max and a percentage of 1RM. Two, this relationship is relatively stable between individuals. And three, this relationship is relatively stable between exercises. To be frank, until now, all of these assumptions were unjustified. There have been multiple attempts to create relationships between a given rep max and a percentage of 1RM. You have old school equations like the Epley and Brzezicki formulas, the NSCA loading chart, and a variety of other calculators online. More recently, with the introduction of RAR-based RPE by Mike Couchier of Reactive Training Systems, tables have been created that reference a predicted rep max by summing the reps performed with the number of perceived RAR. However, the data these methods are based upon is scarce, subject to inaccurate predictions, and difficult to separate the signal from noise due to small samples and limited statistical tools. Moreover, there really hasn't been a systematic exploration of moderating factors of these relationships, such as biological sex or exercise selection, all of which would be important to tease out to improve our predictions. Thankfully, a recent meta-regression by Nuzzo and colleagues sought to better investigate these relationships using data from over 7,000 lifters. To summarize, the meta-regression from Nuzzo and colleagues did a few things. One, they gathered all the data in which lifters performed repetitions to the failure test at various relative loads and exercises. Then they performed linear and non-linear multi-level meta-regressions to estimate the mean and the standard deviation of the number of repetitions possible at each of the percentages of 1RM. Finally, they performed additional moderator analyses to see if this relationship was dependent on other factors like sex, age, or exercise selection. Overall, the authors reported tight estimates in the range of 50 to 100% of 1RM, but less so at lower loads. The relationship didn't seem to be dependent on sex, age, or training status. However, exercise selection seemed to play a role with more repetitions being performed in the leg press and less in the bench press than other exercises. 
all in all, this model is the most robust tool we've ever had access to. With that said, I think there are still some limitations that are worth considering when looking to apply this to training. First, this model doesn't seem to make perfect predictions at 100% of 1RM. For my calculations, the main models predict somewhere just above two repetitions possible at 100% of 1RM with a non-zero standard deviation. By definition, this is inaccurate. To be clear, the authors were completely aware of this, and they fit some models that force a prediction of one rep at 100% of 1RM, but the models they tried predicted impossible values that were less than zero repetitions and fit the data, uh, the rest of the data a bit worse. From my perspective, most of the inaccuracies in these models occur at very low loads, less than 30% of 1RM, which is rarely used in training. Thus, the benefit in the predictions in the range that most lifters are using E1RM, somewhere in the 85 to 100% of 1RM range, I refit and compared a few candidate models after making some of these adjustments. And without getting on my soapbox too much, this is the only possible because the authors made their data and code openly available, which is an honorable practice to allow further exploration of the data. So to summarize what I did, I forced the models to predict one rep in a standard deviation of zero at 100% of 1RM. And then I fit linear and nonlinear models that follow this constraint and compare these models for the balance of complexity and the probability that they're overfitting the data we have access to. The models that survived was a linear log model for mean repetitions and a second order polynomial for the standard deviation. With these adjusted models in hand, now we can put all the pieces together and change the game with regards to SMA 1RM calculations. To create a modernized load and RER chart, I extracted the predictions from these models at increments of 0.01 percentage 1RM. Then for each rep max value, going in half repetition increments to account for half RPEs, I located the percentage of 1RM that was the closest to the desired value. Then by finally referencing equalities in a given rep max, such that a 5RM is equivalent to three reps at a 2RIR, you have the entire table. Now we could just stop there. However, due to the clear individual differences in reps performed and potential differences between exercises, I wanted to take things a step further. Using the predicted standard deviation at the same loads, I created tables for low and high rep capacities. These would correspond to individuals or exercises in which an abnormal amount of repetitions could be performed. I believe these tables are the best way to use estimated 1RM in 2024 and are importantly are reflected in our lower cost infinity programming system. I've also included a link in the description to download these tables for free so that you can use them in your own programming. Estimated 1RM may be the training metric with the highest ROI. It's extremely simple, yet can be useful in a variety of contexts to prescribe and monitor training. With a recent analysis from Nuzzle and colleagues and some in-house adjustments, we've created freely available tools to make use of estimated 1RM more accurate and generalizable. If you liked the video, be sure to subscribe, leave a like, and let us know what you want to see from us next in the comments below. And if you want more free content like this directly in your inbox, sign up for our newsletter, which is the first link below.